quite yet. Let's give it maybe one more minute. Yeah, it looks like we have some of the, oh, we have people in grades six, grade eight, and grade 10. It's from Louisville today. Welcome, everybody. And I know we have some other participants. It'd be great if we could just give it, get an idea of what part of the country you're in. If you're, we have Lovell in Colorado, well, grade six. We have two six, grade one eight, one tenth so far from Loveland and Louisville. And if we have anyone else, um, I could get a kind of an idea. If there's one person in here, I'm pretty sure I know who he is. Uh, we also have Lakewood. And maybe one more. And then I'll go ahead and get started. Thanks for sharing. And I am here today. But let's go ahead and get started I'm here with my colleague today, Mr. Carl Clark. And he is a education coordinator. Uh, and there's, there's something great about this experience is that uh, coming to you from our homes today. I, I see we hear right here as well, but we're doing our work and we want to share with you. We have another person joining us. So I don't let that person in, but we want to share with you everything that uh, our work entails. And every Thursday we meet with someone who works within you car to learn what they do in their jobs and answer the questions from those of you joining us. Really, really important part of uh, doing work with cars that there are very many different types of jobs, such as a scientist, an engineer, an electrician, a computer programmer, safety experts, machinist, editors, and all the different jobs and more support our scientific research. And now, with no further ado, I am going to turn it over to Mr. Clark, and he's going to more about what else and take your questions. Go ahead, Carl. All right, thank you, Tim. And I'm very, very excited to be here. I'm so happy that I'm actually getting to talk about science and education at the same time, not one or the other. So with that, I'm gonna share my screen and let the presentation, let the fun begin. Okay. So my name is Carl Clark and I am a senior education program rep in the Department of Energy at Brookhaven National Lab. And today I'm gonna to be talking about opportunities, field of opportunities when science and education meets. I was an intern at UCAR. I had a wonderful time and it spurred something in me. Now, so much so that I'm now working at the bridge between these two fields in the Department of Energy. Again, I'm talking about opportunities when science and education meets. And to give you a better idea of who I am, I am that program coordinator. I coordinate college and university programs um, for Brookhaven National Lab, which is located in Brooklyn, sorry, which is located in Upton, New York on Long Island. So on the Eastern end, I live in Brooklyn. So every day I commute pre-COVID at least an hour and a half just to get to work. That's how, how much I really enjoy going to work. And as you can see here, I just put up a few images I wanted to, to capture. First and foremost, the wonderful um, New York skyline from Brooklyn. The second image is that beautiful gopher. We have these all over the campus at Brookhaven National Lab. So this is one of the favorite things that I get to see and get to interact with um, at the lab. And I've also shown you right here, a national synchrotron light source. This is a particle accelerator. And this particle accelerator can fit Yankee Stadium inside its, 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 its boundaries. So this is a very big, big facility. And it's free to use for the public, um, for researchers, for industry. And it's a great opportunity for wonderful collaborations to take place. And lastly, another component of my job at Brookhaven National Lab is to develop a model that other federally funded research and development centers could use to engage students, engage underrepresented minorities who want to become faculty 
um, at colleges and universities. So I have a wonderful job um, bridging both science and education. And Carl, if I could interrupt for just a second. Your audio is breaking up just a tiny bit. And I was wondering if, um, if possibly you could uh, reduce your video if it's on HD, if you could use it, that might help a little bit. Um, no worries, just wanted to let you know, you know, just a little bit. Are there, is this, has it improved? I uh, still copy just a little bit. I think um, just taking a little more time uh, with your words might help us out. So I don't want to miss anything from you. Um, let me do a quick video chat. Sorry about this, folks. Murphy's Law, anything that can happen will happen. Okay, hopefully this is better. Is there any improvement in my audio? Yes, there's a little bit of an improvement, yes. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so what is my connection to UCAR? I mentioned earlier that I was an intern at UCAR at a wonderful time, but it all started, or my journey began actually in Jamaica. I went to an all boys school thinking that I'm gonna become a lawyer. And my dream was to become that lawyer. However, after several hurricanes, which Jamaica, which is located in 90 miles from Cuba, we got in 2004, Hurricane Ivan. And Hurricane Ivan was a wonderful time, but also caused significant damage. And I said a wonderful time because it initiated my interest in understanding the atmosphere, how it works, how it interacts and the impact that it has on society. And additionally, it also impacted, how can we learn more about it? How can we get involved as public, as students, as adults, as teachers, in general, how can we make ourselves better informed about these storms? And when I moved to the US the following year in 2005, there was Hurricane Katrina a significant, significant impact that caused not only economic damage, but also great uh, impact on the people that it impacted. As you see here, this image at the bottom that indicate Hurricane Katrina, it affected not only New Orleans, but also Florida, and also all the different states that the storm passed through. So these two pivotal events shaped my interest in in the environment, in nature, in climate, and shifted me away from the lawyer that I initially thought I was gonna become. But that was a great shift because in 2008, I came and had a wonderful time at UCAR through a program called SOARS. SOARS, when I applied to SOARS, I applied not only just for the science itself, but also for the educational component of it. And my very first week at UCAR, there was an optical obstacle training that we did as a team building activity. And I had a wonderful time. Look at me perch, um, trying to help one of my um, colleagues. So with this, I decided that, okay, there was an opportunity here. I'm learning about the science and I'm also participating in education from a research standpoint. And I decided I really wanna to go to grad school to study more about the atmosphere. But when I got to grad school, as this gift showed, I showed up really thinking that I look really good. I feel so happy, I feel like I belong. But at the same time, something was missing because I did, and I applied for a program that focuses only on learning more about the atmosphere. What was missing was that I needed to learn more about the people that are impacted by the atmosphere. This was an opportunity where I can learn more about ways to encourage the public to learn more about the science, to learn more about how to participate in the atmospheric 
experience. I'm looking at ways that I can engage, I can interact with, I can communicate, I can talk to, I can learn with very diverse groups from students to researchers, to the general public. And lastly, I wanted to know more about myself. And I wanted the people that engage in science to learn more about themselves as they participate in scientific activities. Hence, in grad school, I shifted my major from atmospheric science to science education because it afforded all of these opportunities, personally for me, but also for the audiences and for everyone, and in general, the public. And that led to me deciding that for my program in, gra in graduate school, I wanted to do citizen science. Citizen so science affords opportunity for the public to participate in scientific experience and activities while still having fun. Whether it is a dad and his daughter looking at crabs, looking at the growth of crabs in an ecosystem, or simply going out just to catch some crabs or some fish, but at the same time could learn the science that's associated with their, um, their excursion, just having fun. And also, it could be teachers and their students. There are many schools right now in the US and over the past decade that has significantly ramped up citizen, citizen science participation as part of their curriculum. And when I was at UCAR, I participated in a program with, uh, with some wonderful mentors, with some wonderful researchers that exposed me to learning more about phenology and how to get, engage, how to get the public participating in collecting data, scientific data about the life cycles of trees. It was a great experience. I was learning, but also it provide opportunity to connect the science with just having fun of learning more about tree fall, changing of colors on the leaves of a tree. All of these opportunities or happenings serve as a good catalyst for my next step. And another citizen science project or the first citizen science project that I actually participated in was called Project Budverse which is now at the Chicago Botanical Garden. And by coincidence, I happened to, to be featured on this publication with one of my wonderful mentors when I was at UCAR. So citizen science afforded opportunities for students, for the public, for professionals, all to participate in science, but through collaboration which also means that there's a lot of data, a lot of scientific data that can be collected from this collaboration because you're getting the public involved. And as scientists, as professionals or science professionals, we are a small community. If, but if you think about having the large masses, have you participate and co start collecting data, the amount of information that you collect significantly ramp up what scientists are able to, to do which now leads to a wonderful question, is how accurate is the data that thousands, possibly millions of people collecting? How accurate is that data? And that's a question that I hope that you can, and you'll share your thoughts. So my question to you is, if you have thousands and thousands of people start collecting data and contributing to science, how accurate do you think that data is as it compares to what scientists alone are able to do. So go ahead in a chat box or chat function. Let's hear your thoughts. Give us some percentages in terms of how you think how accurate citizen science data collected by the public is. I'm gonna give a pause and give possibly 20 seconds. So Tim, please be on the lookout. Um, Let's see some comments and let me know what they what they think. Well, I'm going to be surprised. We all have two uh, comments. One of them, the first one says 70 to 90 cents. 
And the second comment is 85%. And it looks like we have a third coming 75%. Ah. All right, let's find out. So right here, I pulled up two studies. One looked at quantitative, look at a lot of publications to see how accurate the data is. And I'm gonna circle this one, that is where my, my pointer is. Hopefully my audio is still going strong, but it shows yes. that there was an 81% agreement that volunteer data and scientific data um, there was strong agreement between those two. So whoever bumped up to 81%, you're, that's pretty good. That's very, very good in terms of numbers. And other study that looked at thousands, looked at um, many, many other studies to see how accurate or how much agreement there is. The numbers is pretty much the same as well. It's close to 75, 81, 85, between 75 and 85% accuracy. So that's pretty good. And that was an opportunity that I wanted to take away from getting the public involved in collecting and participating in science, but having fun doing so. Now, I'm gonna shift gears because as part of my trajectory, whether it is first starting out thinking that I'm gonna become a lawyer to start doing, um, trying to become a scientific researcher, but incorporating a public in this, I'm, I've always been fascinated with how we learn, why we learn, how to improve the way we learn, how to actively participate in science, whether through science education or citizen science opportunities. And that led me to becoming a high school teacher. And believe it or not, I went to school to get my master's at the American Museum of Natural History. And if this looks familiar with Ben Stiller, that is a night at the museum, the museum that was featured in that movie. So if you haven't seen that movie, I highly recommend. If you want to have some fun since we're at home during COVID, please check out this movie. But this was an opportunity for me to go to school in a museum where they have that big, massive planetarium where I can participate and encourage um, my future students to learn in a fun, innovative, free environment, while at the same time taking those principles and put it in a formal classroom. So for any of us or any of you that are in sixth grade, fifth grade, 10th grade, what you might notice how th there's a change in how your teachers teach. There's a change in how much creativity, how much freedom, how much different, the various different teaching styles they've incorporated. And those styles are rooted in what's done at places like the American Museum of Natural History or in citizen science. So as a high school teacher, I taught at a theater art school. It's a school just in Times Square here in New York. And if you walk by the school, you will never know that there's a school there. Coming from a research and an informal science background, I incorporate that into my science teaching at this theater school. And one of the things that I did was get my students to participate in the United Nations General Assembly programming. I got my students to participate in NASA Challenger Learning Centers. NASA has these centers where you can simulate what it means to be a scientist or astronaut in space. So, Tying all of those pieces together, I got my students to participate in a, a lot of diverse ways, a lot of fun ways of doing science, while at the same time still doing very strong science. So for, well, for think, you to... I think you have a fan there. One of our, one of our visitors said uh, they, saw the, they saw Night at the Museum. So you reach into the choir here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited. I love that. Yes. So since you've seen Night at the Museum. I've actually I've, seen um, about, th I've seen two of the movies. So do you remember the dinosaurs that were in the movie? Yes, there was the, in the second one, they introduced the Triceratops and first one, it was the T-Rex. 
Okay, so this is my question for you as for everyone as well. Since not a museum has spurred opportunities for you to learn about dinosaurs, it's a great opportunity to actually apply what you learn in school to what is being done through movies. How well do you know your dinosaurs? So, um, I have, not wait, hold, that on. Well. hold on, hold this one, let's see. You actually, you know it, I'm gonna, you're gonna see very shortly. I have a dinosaur up. I'm gonna give you time a second to see if you can identify this dinosaur. Put that in the chat. Let's see if you can make some guesses. Time starts now. No one, no guess yet, but there's still some time. Think about it. All right, three, two, one, that's time. Are there any guesses? No, no one's, oh wait, we do have a, a Myosaur, M-Y-O-S-A-U-R, and a T-Rex, someone else kept T-Rex, and that's the only one they knew, it's a T-Rex. <laughs> okay, unfortunately, neither. This is a Sictacosaurus. Four feet long, the tail is two feet, but it's in the family of a triceratops. It doesn't have the it doesn't have the horns, but it's in the same family as the triceratops. That was a hard one. I'm not gonna lie, that was a hard one. Here's another one. This was an image that's said, taken offered at the this museum. One is a an herbivore, so this, do you know if it's an herbivore? Someone that one of our guests said, I think this is an herbivore. I can tell it's a herbivore because I know that most herbivore dinosaurs had some kind of sort of beak. And due to that, this one sort of, since this one is a relative of the Triceratops, the Triceratops had a big beak but also they had teeth. So I can sort of, sort of tell that this is a herbivore. Okay. So with that, do you know the name? Again, you have 20 seconds for the second image, the one that I just brought up. Can you identify in the chat box what this new one that I just placed up, what that dinosaur is? Two seconds. I think we have people who've already guessed a, a triceratops. <laughs> yeah, that was an easy one. I, 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 I knew that was gonna be a good one. Okay, so if you notice here, the first one is in a family. It doesn't have the horns. You have the triceratops, that was an easy one. And my last one, pretty easy. Do not call this one out. I'm gonna give you 20 seconds. Here it is, <laughs> go. It's the dinosaur in the forefront. I want to give everyone a chance to make a guess. Three, two, one. All right, Tim. Looks like everyone said this one was a Tyrannosaurus Rex. Okay, you got it. So the reason why I brought up all of these is because one, I want you to realize that whenever you go to a museum, whenever you watch a movie, science is embedded in many of the in many of these environments and it's a natural part of these environments. And I wanted you to connect with what you learn in class with what you do for fun. And these dinosaurs are a clear example that as a high school teacher or as a teacher in general, as someone who's connected formal classroom learning in school with things I do for fun, like, like watching those movies and actually learn about dinosaurs, I can connect those two together and make a better identity of who I am as a person and what I love. Now, my last one, the name is not gonna be placed there, but a fun fact, is the museum 
the Natural History Museum here in New York, they had this lovely creature as an exhibit. So visitors will walk by and they will observe this wonderful, lovely creature. I'm not gonna say the name. So this is my challenge to you. This, uh, this creature had feathers, which was something that was surprising because they thought, or new research has suggested that um, some dinosaurs or certain species of dinosaurs had feathers, which connects to the birds have that lineage from dinosaurs. So my take home is, can you identify this? Not right now, what this creature is. Well, I got a surprise for you. <laughs> I'm pretty sure someone has already guessed. And unfortunately, we have only got about a minute left to go. So I was wondering if we could for any questions. And uh, and if you want, we can you can share the name. Oh, yes, we have a lot of people who who've already responded. And I'm just going to ask: Is it a hadasaur? A giant bird or <laughs> those are two guesses. Are either one is close? If you say giant birdosaur, that is unfortunately we're gonna have to pass on that one. <laughs> okay, well, I'm gonna check just to, to make sure we have uh, respect everyone's time. I'll just see if there's any questions for all before we unfortunately do have to end the day. And everyone, I am going to put to the chat the URL for Meet the Experts so you can see this recording again. If you like, uh, give us a couple about a week to upload and uh, any of the others that occurred previously. And while I was talking, I was waiting to see if the extra questions came in. I haven't seen any, any yet. I do appreciate everybody joining us and, of course, our, our special guest. Uh, and I, I can tell straight away this was too short of a period of time for all of this uh, that Carl has for this. And while we're waiting, are there any is there any thoughts you'd like want to take away with them uh, before we do conclude, Carl? I do. So what I wanted to take away from this recording is have fun, have fun just living. At the same time, science is embedded around us. And the many of the things you see on TV, many of the things that you do for fun outside could, parts, could contribute to high quality scientific research, which will benefit the type of life we live and you better understanding and hopefully becoming scientists, science educators, teachers, engineers. It, it will build your interest. Wonderful. And we do have a response. Someone says to thank you so much. Your education journey interest presentation is so inspiring. Thank you for reminding us of the importance of having fun as we live and learn. And another thank you. All right. Thank you for having me. All right, and so online we are going to have to end today, but everyone, please do check the Meet the Expert site, and we will see you in a couple weeks. Thank you so much. And this, we had, uh, this one is their favorite part. That was another response. <laughs> okay, bye now, everyone. All right, take care.